This is Professor Chuck Bland welcoming you to this video tutorial here to guide you through using the Smith chart to design a double stubbed impedance matching network. The overall objective that we're going to be employing today is to explain how to create a double stub matching network using the practical application of theory and personal study, things you've learned on your own. The emphasis is going to be though on procedure and practice, yet providing some backing theory without getting lost, just enough to help make it all set, make sense. So our overall plan is to collect all these pieces together to describe the needed processes and formulas. We're gonna review the procedures and outline the steps to a solution, and we're gonna work examples, applying the pieces and procedure to work two examples. So let's get started, here we go. Starting with the pieces, we're gonna take a quick look at the Smith chart fundamentals. The three key mathematic principles that we need to keep in mind in this process, we're gonna look at those. And then one particular method that might seem like a bit of a sleight of hand, but it's used to help make this whole process work. So we're gonna get into all of that. So let's start with the Smith chart. This is not intended to be a complete explanation of the Smith chart. That's, that's a lecture all by itself. I just wanna point out some important concepts behind the Smith chart as they are used in this process. It's a graphical method for solving many transmission line problems, and it displays complex gamma. We can easily plot and determine values of gamma and impedance as a function of length, since all of that is related, and remembering our length here is the circumference around the chart, this is wavelength. It's a half wavelength in the trip all the way around the Smith chart. A few more basics here. This axis through the middle and the circles that cut across it represent the real part of the impedance value. These circles along here represent the imaginary part of the impedance. Do note that this upper hemisphere is the inductive region. The values are positive. The reactive values are positive. And below the reactive values are negative, which hopefully you recall that this is the capacitive region. So you need to keep all this in mind as you're working with the Smith chart. Also recall that impedances are represented on the Smith chart as values normalized to the characteristic impedance of the transmission line, often called Z sub O. So this center point right here represents our load impedance equaling the characteristic impedance and no imaginary part. That would be one plus J zero right there. And it's a reference point for many of our operations. There is a relationship to us between gamma and impedance for a given load impedance and characteristic impedance on a length of transmission line. I can show one here, and we've normalized it to 50 ohms. We can plot a load impedance and note the radius that goes from the matching point to that impedance. That radius represents the magnitude of gamma. Remember that the Smith chart represents complex gamma. Well, this radius is our magnitude of the gamma. We can draw a circle that represents the constant gamma. And actually then see as we move around this circle, we are moving, remember I told you the as we move around the Smith chart, we're moving down the transmission line. And as we're doing this, our impedance is transforming, but this only works if we're following a constant gamma radius. Now there's one more thing here I need for you to notice. Moving along that circle, <laughs> circle of constant gamma happens as we move along the transmission line like it's shown here. So, Moving from here around this way is analogous to starting with this load and moving along this transmission line. It's important to know this is how we can connect between what we're seeing here and what we're actually doing out in the real world. An important circle on the Smith chart is this matching circle or unity circle. It represents the place where the real part of the normalized impedance equals Z naught. 
our, our characteristic impedance. This ends up being a very useful tool in our design process since we can move this circle on the chart on a constant gamma radius like you saw me do. We can then determine target impedances at a different point on the transmission line that will eventually get us a match. I also want you to notice here, for because we're going to need to know this, the center of this circle is on the 3J0 point, just for your reference. Now this circle, this matching circle, can be rotated on a constant radius, that constant gamma thing we talked about, representing how the impedance will look at some distance away from the matching point and down the transmission line. We can also work back towards the unity circle and when we move that unity circle to some other location, we call that the auxiliary circle. Now it's important to note, as I, as I mentioned, our radius is from the matching point to three. That is our radius. So we can then, if we want to move, in this case, three-eighths of a wavelength, then we can rotate that center point three-eighths of a wavelength and then draw the circle. And now this is the range of impedances that exist three-eighths of a wavelength away from the matching circle. It's a pretty nifty tool that we are going to use in our matching process. Let me show these two graphics together to kind of finish out this explanation. The point of our matched impedance is this red circle. And this is our location here at stub two. So when we are at this point on our transmission line, we should be at the very least on this circle. And once we've added the stub, then we should be right on our matching point. If we shift this matching circle by D2, in the case of our illustration, 3 8 lambda, we end up on the green circle on the Smith chart and at the first stub. With the idea being, as we move from the load down the transmission line in our process, we get to this point, if we can get onto this auxiliary circle, then we know once we've moved this distance back toward the generator, we're going to be on this matching circle. And it's very simple then to complete the process to get our match. And that's the whole process. Let's look at this from just the perspective of the transmission line for a minute. Consider that we start at the load and we're going to be moving toward the generator. At the load we see our load impedance and we're going to move away from the load and as we do so that impedance is transformed. We eventually get to the first stub but need to get to the impedance, I'm sorry, need to get the impedance to a point on the Smith chart where we can know we will land on the auxiliary matching circle. And that is the purpose of this first stub, to provide the needed reactants to move the impedance onto the auxiliary matching circle. The overall goal is to have a match at the location of the second stub once the second stub is added. That means we'll be on the matching circle, the auxiliary circle, no, not the auxiliary, the matching circle at the second stub. In order to move to the matching circle, we move the impedance along the transmission line toward the generator from the first stub to the second stub by this distance D2. That places the impedance on the matching circle. The last step in the process then is to determine the characteristics of this second stub that will then place us on the matching point on the matching circle and we have our match. Okay. So now let's look at our key mathematic relationships. Mentioned before, I'm going to make no effort at proof or derivation here. Just wanted to remind you that these exist. So key is this impedance transformation on a transmission line. You can see the formula here. By moving away from the load toward the generator, the impedance that we see from Z sub L is transformed eventually to Zn as a function of this distance L. Now this applies for a given characteristic impedance, transmission line phase delay, and the load impedance. Remember that the Smith chart is also wavelength. So we care this distance here is wavelength. 
The next key relationship we care about is the relationship between the reflection coefficient, gamma, and distance. If we hold gamma constant but move along the transmission line, represented by this outer red circle here, we can see the many solutions for gamma which correlate to the impedance transformation along the transmission line. And this is the math relationship that helps us see that. Last, I want to show you that there is an analytic approach to determining the forbidden zone. This slide has the most math of the presentation, but it boils down to a simple equation. This is the equation for the conductance G after the first stub and the distance separating the stubs. That can actually be at any point as, as a function of distance. Remember that G is normalized and must be a real quantity. With that in mind, look at this radical here and notice then that in order for this to be real, this part of the equation, this is a one minus X here, this part of the equation has to range from zero to one in order to maintain this being real. So we don't have a square root of a minus number. This gives us a constraint for G being between zero and this value here, otherwise known as zero and one over sine squared beta D. This boundary, this value that we get here for G defines the edge of the forbidden zone. So let's, let's look at this a little bit. Revisiting the auxiliary circle here in green, note that we need to get the, our impedance after the first stub is applied to be on the AUC. We need to eventually get onto this in order to have a matchable solution. When we carefully inspect the circle here, we notice that the minimum conductance value on the auxiliary circle in this particular case is 0.5. It falls on the two circle, but remember this is a, a, a impedance circle and not an admittance circle. Conductance is part of admittance. So this would be G equals 0.5 or reactance equals two. We can't have any smaller values of conductance over here in this side and land on this circle. It is just physically impossible. So this region here below this G equals 0.5 is our forbidden zone. It won't get us onto the circle and we can't have a solution. So the graphic representation of the unacceptable conductances is shaded on this chart. It's this red area. It means the normalized load conductance after spanning any distance between the load and the first stub cannot fall within this region since it could never be transformed to land onto this auxiliary matching circle. We have to get outside that region in order to be able to get on a circle that gets us to this auxiliary matching circle. We can use this formula right here to analytically determine the boundary of the forbidden zone as a function of beta, which is the transmission line phase constant, and the distance between the two stubs. For example, if our D2 is lambda over eight, again, the distance between the stubs, our beta then is given as two pi over lambda. Beta D2 ends up being pi over four and sine squared beta D ends up being 0.5. One over 0.5 equals two if we're gonna look at this on an admittance chart. So the forbidden region will be bounded by the two circle or in terms of admittance, the one half circle. It's the same point either way. It just, which, which way are you doing it? If the impedance, if the distance between the load impedance and the first stub is zero, that means that our load impedance cannot be within the forbidden zone because we we're not moving anywhere, right? So we, 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 have to, we have to start outside of here. If however, it does land inside here, we have a couple of options. Or if we can't get out of the, the forbidden zone in general, we have two options to approach that. We move the first stub toward the generator, which is also away from the load. 
and eventually moving the load outside of the forbidden zone. We can do that. Also, we can change the distance between the stubs until this auxiliary circle crosses the constant conductive circle through the load admittance point. So if our load was over here, we would need to move this circle by shifting those points till we got it inside that circle. It shrinks the forbidden zone, which helps us. So we can do that, but it's changing the physical characteristics and design of our of our matching network. So those are the options we have if we run into a problem with with all this in mind, especially the lowdown on the forbidden zone, let's move on to a review of the overall process, then work our examples. Our first step is to draw the auxiliary unity circle and rotate it the distance D1 to D2. Recall that the center of the matching circle is on 3J0. Use your compass to rotate that point toward the generator by the distance D2. Using that point as your new center, draw a circle for the same radius as the matching circle on that point. For step two, plot your load impedance as an admittance YL. We're going to work in admittance mode on the chart. Step three, if D1, this distance here, does not equal zero, then we need to transform our load admittance by moving it toward the generator by the distance d1. Step four will then have you checking the forbidden zone issues and if there is a problem your remedies include changing d1 or d2 as we talked about previously. Step five is where you can move one of the two directions to land on the auxiliary circle and will require different values of susceptance to accomplish that. When you have your two solutions you will want to use the solutions with the shorter stub links. No matter which way the move is done, we can now determine the amount of susceptance for the first stub that we will need to, to get us onto the auxiliary circle, to get our, our admittance onto it. For step six, we're going to move that new admittance the distance of D2, which should place it on the matching circle. And then lastly, we will determine the amount of susceptance D2, L2 will need, I'm sorry, the second stub will need to contribute to move the admittance to the matching point. I remind you again, this process yields two solutions for each stub. The shorter stubs are preferred because they provide wider bandwidth for the solutions. It makes them easier to optimize and tune. So that's the process in general. So let's go look at some examples. On this first example, I will only do one solution. I will do two solutions for the second example. I do find it helpful to look at both the Smith chart and the transmission line diagram, so I'll be referring to both diagrams throughout the examples. So here's our characteristics for the first example. Our uh, characteristic impedance, 50 ohms. Our load impedance is 25. Our normalized load is 0.5J0. Our normalized inductance is 2 plus J0. Our distance D1 to the first stub right here is 0.125 lambda, and our distance between stubs is 0.375 lambda. So let's, let's make this happen. Let's start by highlighting the unitary conductance circle, 1 plus J0. This just is an easy thing to do. Remember that the center is centered here on 3J0. Draw the auxiliary unit circle, which is rotated the distance stub 2 to stub 1 toward the load. In this case, 0.375. So we've taken our arc, we've drawn it around to here, and we've moved that circle to the next position. So that puts us over here. Plot our admittance. So we're going to put that point right there where it belongs. We're going to rotate on a constant gamma circle toward the generator by the distance d1, which is one eighth of a wavelength. So this is, here's our rotation, and here we are. Do a quick forbidden zone check. Notice y1 is well outside of the forbidden zone, so we have no forbidden zone. In. Since our d1 is non-zero, we are going to move 
our load impedance on the Smith chart. We're going to do that constant gamma circle rotation by the length d1, which is 1 8 of a wavelength, 1 8 lambda. Move that over to here. That puts us at point y1. y1, 0.8 minus j.6. And notice that our uh, susceptance is minus j.6. The susceptances are, are what we're going to be paying attention to. This is the admittance at the location of the first stub, hence the green circle. We have not shown the effect of the stub just yet, and Y1 is the point from which we will move to the edge of the auxiliary matching circle. Remember, we have two possibilities. We can go this way or this way. We're only going to do one solution, so we're going to move that. So moving Y1 along a line of constant conductance, along one of these lines here, because we're only going to be adding susceptance with the stub. We can only do that. It can't add real. So we're going to move along there until we reach the edge of the circle and land on it. This point, Y2, it, the susceptance there is what we care about. So in order to have the needed value of susceptance here, we need the stub to contribute some value of susceptance such that the susceptance of the stub plus the susceptance at Y1 equals the susceptance at Y2. Doing the math, we find then that the susceptance of the stub is going to be susceptance of Y2 minus susceptance Y1. So let's do the math and take a look. Here's all our values, here's the equation, and we see that the value we need for the stub susceptance is J positive 0.58. It's the amount of susceptance we need to move our susceptance from here to here along this constant conductance circle. We're going to mark that susceptance out here on the Smith chart, noting that our lambda is at 0.083. Now we can determine the length of the stub. Since we're working in admittance, we're going to start over on the right-hand side of the chart. This, for impedance, this is infinity, but for admittance, this is zero on this side. So we start from here and rotate toward the generator until we reach this point. We've traveled a quarter wavelength plus the additional 0 0.083, which is measured from this point. And the sum of those two numbers gives us our 0.33, which is the length of our first stub. Now, for the next point, we're going to rotate Y2. Now that we're on this matching circle, we're going to rotate it on a circle of constant gamma, the distance between the two stubs. This is that same distance we used to move this circle to here. Now we're moving backwards. Let me say it this way. At the beginning of the process, we drew the, uh, the auxiliary circle by moving its points from here to here. Now that we're on that circle, we can move it back to the matching circle because we know what this distance is. And that's what we're doing here with Y2. We are moving that back over to here till it lands on the circle and we're going to call that point y3. Note that the susceptance is minus j.22. This now helps us identify y3 which is the amount of susceptance that we need in order to get a match. So let's take a look at this. This susceptance is going to be contributed by the second so y3 being 1 minus, 2, 2, 1 minus j22, the susceptance is minus j.22. So stub L2 needs to add a positive 0.22 of susceptance in order to cancel. Remember, we need to get on to 1j0, no susceptance. So it's just going to be the minus of the susceptance at the point y3. So we switch the sign and we're good to go. Let's mark that point on the edge of our circle and we can see the distance it takes to get there. That's our quarter wavelength plus the extra 0 0.034 from here to here, which means our length of our second stub is 0.284 lambda. So there's our solution for the first example. I'm going to leave the second solution for you to do, but let's take a look at 
the second example. So here's our values for the second example. You can see all these here. So here we go. We're going to highlight our unity circle again. We're going to create the auxiliary circle moving at this distance D2. Let's plot our admittance and note that the actual load admittance hasn't been moved the distance of D1 yet. This is still right here at this point. Rotate it, moving it this distance of D1 toward the generator, noting that our susceptance is a positive 1.31. Remember, the stub hasn't been added yet. Quick check on the forbidden zone. We're doing okay. Now we're going to move Y1 along the line of constant conductance until the edge of the circle is reached. This is for the first solution for the first stub. We're doing two solutions here. Susceptance Y2 is a susceptance at this point in its positive J2.0. In order to have the needed value of susceptance, we need the first stub to contribute what we're going to call BL1, such that BL1 plus the susceptance BY1 equals BY2. To solve for BL1, the stub needs to provide BY2 minus BY1 in terms of susceptance. Let's do the math. Here we go. When we do the calculation, we find out we need 0.69J for our susceptance from the stub. That's what we need for the stub. Let's mark that spot on our chart over here. We notice it's at 0 0.096 lambda. Doing our measurement here, we see 0 0.25 plus 0 0.096 means our first stub L1A is 0 0.346. Now let's do the second solution. We're going to, instead of moving this way from Y1, we're going to move this way from Y1, and our Y2 is going to be on the circle over here on this side. Noting our susceptance is positive 0 0.05. In order to have the needed value of BY2, we need to have a stub to contribute BL1, such that BL1 plus BY1 equals BY2. Solving for BL1, it's BY2 minus BY1. Doing the math, we find that susceptance is minus 1.26. And our lambda is at 0.357. So the total stub length is going to, here's, here's our admittance, I'm sorry, susceptance down here. Since we're starting at this point at 0.25, this time we're going to subtract 0.25 from this 0.357. That gives us our distance of 107, 0.107. So that's L1B. That's the second solution for the first stub. So we now have our two solutions for the first stub. Let's move on down the transmission line now. First solution for the second stub. So we're going to rotate Y2 along a circle of constant gamma, this distance D2, which is the separation between the two stubs, which will place us back on the unity circle at point Y3. We can note that our lambda is 0.184 and that y3 is 1 minus j2.1. We're now on the unity circle and need to add susceptance to cancel the susceptance we have. We're physically at this point right here, but without the application of the second stub. So our susceptance that we need to cancel is the minus of the susceptance that we have. In this case, since we have minus 2.1, we need a positive 2.1. We mark that spot out here. We find it's at 0.184. Calculating the distance, we find the length of the second stub for the first solution, L2A, is going to be 0 0.3, I'm sorry, 0 0.434 lambda. So that's our first solution for the second stub. Our second solution, we're going to move our point Y2 over here to point Y3, we find we will have a positive susceptance of 0.18. 
but that puts us on the unity circle. And so we just need now to add susceptance to cancel the susceptance we have and move us on to the matching point. So determining we need a minus 0.18 susceptance, we mark that spot on our Smith chart and measure off the distance from this side and we find it is a 0.219 lambda. That is the second solution for the second stub. L to B. So here's the summary of the two solutions. First one, L1 is 0.364 and L2 is 0.434. For the second solution, 0.107 and 0.219. Notice these are the smaller ones, so solution two is the desirable solution. That's it. That's the process. That's all we need to do to create those matching stubs. I hope the tutorial has provided you a clear view of the process and to make it easy for you to accomplish your own designs. So long.